and in some way we can start. Okay, sure. Thank you, Dr. Lin. Yeah, okay. So uh, today I'll be presenting on probabilistic delta debugging. Uh, it's uh, As uh, Dr. Lin mentioned, it's a paper written, uh, submitted for uh, FSD this year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, these are the authors of the paper itself. Uh, mainly they are from Peking University. Uh, for Robbing, I can't find much uh, details on her because uh, she's an she undergraduate. Yeah, she is just yeah. The, he is just an undergrad student in Peking. It's a she, yeah. I think. Oh, she. Yeah. All right, all right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Uh, she's an undergraduate student in Peking University. So uh, I can't find much uh, of her focus area. But uh, for the rest of them, mainly it's in the area of um, software engineering or uh, software testing, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Sure. And uh, for Jin Jie, if I'm not wrong, he was a student from Peking University as well. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. So he is one of the strongest uh, uh, PhD students from Peking University. When he graduated from Peking University, he almost have close to 10 first or the top tier paper. Yeah. Oh, OK. Yeah. And uh, these are the professors, um, from one from Peking University as well as um, uh, both from Peking University. Yeah. Mm. And uh, they, they are also in the idea of port localization as well as um, software analysis and testing. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so uh, just some background on Delta debugging before we jump into the probabilistic aspect of it. So um, in general, Delta debugging is to, the idea behind Delta debugging is to reduce a set of elements while preserving a certain property of it. So this can be useful when we are trying to debug maybe a code or uh, when we are trying to debug the compiler or when we want to find some port localization or just to isolate out such that we do not have to look through the entire code to actually find the, to find the main issue with the, with the code itself. So it's, it's to, we can think of it as to slim down the code so that it's easier for the programmers or the debugger to analyze the code. Yeah, so um, formally, a formal definition of it is that uh, given a, a set of all the objects of interest uh, and a test function, we want to find the smallest possible, we want to find the smallest possible um, set which passes the test case as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's a formal definition of um, delta debugging. Yeah. yeah, I think this is a very general one. So maybe, maybe later you can sp um, provide a more concrete examples. Okay, yeah. Okay, so, um, yeah. so just an example of delta debugging. So over here, I have a short code snippet here. Um, it's you. It's in uh, Python. We can consider it. And uh, essentially, this this code uh, would fail if uh, you were to analyze it. So, uh, just the first question for today, which is um, let's say I'm trying to analyze this code. How how can I actually? What lines can I? What lines should I keep or should I remove so that I can get a smaller test case that has the same behavior, i.e., it still fails the test case. So, mm. um, anyone here would like to give it a try? Yeah, it's quite a simple um, mm. question. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So any volunteer to address this puzzle? Yes. Okay, Darren is mentioned to remove A and B. We only take care of C. Yeah, okay. Uh, actually, um, because we noticed that we are only interested in C, so actually we only need Y and Z as well. So um, in addition, we can also remove uh, line one and two as well. So actually this gives us a very lean code uh, of just four lines. So we actually have the size of the code itself. And then uh, we still get a function, we still get a test case which fails the which fails the assertion. Yeah. And we can see that over here it's very easy to isolate out why exactly the assertion fails. So this, this is one of the useful examples of how delta debugging can help in um help in making the debugging process a lot easier. So um, moving on, so actually um, the, right now, the state of the art uh, delta debugging approach all make use of this algorithm called the DD mean algorithm. So um, yeah, it's a DD, I believe is delta debugging. Yeah, so um, it's a iterative algorithm that splits um, the sequence into N subsequences. So then at every iteration, N doubles itself. So it tries to remove, um, so after it splits X into multiple subsequences, it tries to remove each of the subsequence and, uh, and its complement from X itself. So you get multiple test cases, uh, multiple uh, subsequ subsequences. Yeah, uh, I'll, this might seem a bit um, hard to understand. I'll be giving an example later. 
So, uh, mm. yeah. so maybe the takeaway, a, a brief takeaway here that mm. uh, the ultimate goal is that we now given the sequence only uh, the sub sequence is the root cause input, or it is a ring leader to make some phenomena happen. Yeah, the phenomena can either be about happens or there's some other um, test case path in a failure, whatever it is. So the goal of it is to to invent an algorithm to uh, efficiently locate or identify which sub sequence is a ring leader, and in the algorithm they're trying to split. So sequencing to unsubsequence and the looking to half and a half, but this not yeah. be hundred percent pre precise. Okay. But the looking to half and a half, uh, and how to and play or narrow down and trunk out some subsequences and the narrow down and pinpoint the mm. uh, pinpoint the root cause iteratively. Mm. Correct. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I'll give a example later so that this is a lot clearer. Or oh, uh, maybe maybe I should give the example now. So um, yeah, I'll give the example first. Then I'll come back to this slide. So um, over here, give me a moment. Yeah, okay. So over here, uh, I have I have the same code snippet again. So um, lines one to eight, and over here we can see that if um, okay, true in this case means that the assertion fails. Yeah. So um, let's say I include uh, in the initial phase, we know that these test cases with all eight statements fails the test case. So um, this is a this is a valid um failing of a test case itself, yeah. Then at the first iteration itself, maybe we we split it by half. So we split it along uh line one to four as well as five to eight. So if we only include line one to four, we can see that this um test case will not fail. So this is a fair example, yeah. Then then we split it. Then we look at the complement of the line one to four, which is five to eight, and that also doesn't uh allow it doesn't even allow the program to compile so it, it doesn't even um, pass the test cases yeah then after that because we are not able to find it we were we were um split it into greater greater partitions itself so we look at um one one and two on its own and it also fails then three and four and it carry on this process so after we finish this process we notice that we can look at the complement of um iteration three itself. So the complement of iteration three is um, iteration seven over here. So it's three to eight. And we see that if we only take in three to eight, we actually managed to find a valid test case. So uh, this is a program. These are successful programs which result in the test case failing. Yeah. Then uh, once we have this uh, small snippet, we can actually already exclude out one and two. So we will just work on this three to eight itself. So from three to eight, we start splitting it again. But uh, notice that if we split it again, um, there's actually repeat. So uh, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and five, six, seven, eight. These are all repeat, which um has already been ran previously. So actually, this part here is not evaluated again. So uh, yeah, we can just ignore it. This this part here is just um just to make it clear that actually uh all of these are the all of these are the um, split partitions as well as the complements to it. So five, six, seven, eight is actually the complement to three, four over here. Yeah. Then uh, so we move on to the next complement that we have not seen before, which is three, four, and seven, eight. So actually three, four, seven, eight is a valid test case and it passes. But um, and by right this is this um this set over here iteration um iteration eight is already our so called um optimal um set, but. Um, from a program perspective, it's not able to know if three, four, seven, eight is sufficient. Uh, is is the smaller set, so actually it would run through again the rest of it. So, uh, at this point, it will go um one by one. So three, four, and seven, eight. So if we uh give me a moment, mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, let me move it up. So if we exclude out um three, four, and seven or eight, we notice that all of them fail. So the smallest. Um, delta debugging the smallest set that we can have is actually three four seven eight which was what we derived previously yeah so this is how a delta debugging process will work mm. the dd mean algorithm works which is that at every step it actually um sort of have it and then try to find a try to find a set that passes the test case and it, it it's somewhat like a binary search in a sense yeah um, but the but the, the time the complexity is, is more than yes, binary. The time, yeah. yeah, so the time complexity of this is um definitely not as effective as a binary mm -hmm. search. Yeah. 
But the idea is that we split it into half and if we can find it, then yeah, it's, uh, it's good. Yeah. So um, this, yeah, this is definitely not uh, efficient and it's also not the most effective method. So uh, we will be running through the, a more effective method later, which is the idea behind this probabilistic uh, delta debugging. Yeah, but so um, before that, just to run through some of the state-of-the-art delta debugging approaches that are built on DDMIN is uh, HDD, which is hierarch hierarchical delta debugging, which assumes that the objects itself have a structure of a tree. So this is useful like when we have ASTs, we have the AST already and we would like to do some form of delta debugging to find the smallest um, possible tree that will give us a, that will pass a certain test case or fail a certain test case. Yeah. Then uh, there's also Chiser. Chiser is um is based on C programming itself. Yeah, and it considers the data and control dependency relation. So for example, in cases where um we can see like maybe line seven here, line seven actually has a dependency with um line three and line four. So maybe when eliminating, it doesn't actually um, eliminate. When, uh, when it removes line seven, it when it retains line seven, it will also have to retain line three and line four because there's a dependency on that. Yeah, so there's a chiser method. Mm. So this example over here is actually a more general um, DDMIN algorithm. Yeah, yeah I think this is very foundation. It is really a foundation, a very basic. And mm. uh, I think understanding these algorithms, I think I think uh, Xiang Hui did a very good job to use an example instead of a pseudo code to explain how their the debugging work. And for this part, is anyone have a question? Um, if no question, let's can we can we can further proceed. Yeah, sure. Okay, yeah, uh, feel free to stop me if you have any questions or need any clarifications on this. Yeah, so um, as mentioned, the DDMIN algorithm is um, not sufficiently efficient or effective enough. So actually, um, in certain test cases, it might not be, um, it might not give you the most optimal or the most least number of lines you can think of it. Yeah, so um, it actually follows a predefined sequence. So just now we see that it actually groups them, it splits it in half and then it groups them. So you eliminate the first half, then the second half, and there's a predefined sequence of attempts. So that, that might not actually give us the best um, results itself. So actually it should try to utilize information from uh, test results that has already occurred. So this, uh, this initial DDMIN algorithm is actually very, um, it's very fixed, it's very rigid in the sense that you just follow the sequence and you have it. And after you have it, then you find the complements and stuff like that. So it's a very fixed state, uh, very fixed set. But uh, what this have what were what is bad about it is that you do not actually make use of the information from the previous test. So, for example, if eliminating line eight would already cause your test to fail, then maybe you shouldn't be looking at eliminating line eight. So this um involves certain probability that will be mentioned in this paper. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So um talking about so moving on to the actual paper itself, which is the probabilistic delta debugging algorithm, or in short, um prop DD. So it what it does is that it estimates a probability of the element to be kept in the results itself. So based on what I mentioned just now, if for example, uh, eliminating line eight causes the causes the test case to fail, then maybe we shouldn't eliminate line eight. Yeah, we should try to keep line eight itself. So that that makes use of the it makes use of the current test result to select the next subset of elements so as to maximize the gain of your next test itself. And it uh, once you select the subsets of element, then you test if the desired property is preserved, so whether it passes the test case or not. And if it doesn't pass the test case, or if it passes the test case, you either way, based on the test result, you update the model itself. And then you repeat this process of um, selecting a subset of elements from the. Oh, by the way, so so yeah. here the how many test cases do we have, in this case? Uh, how many test cases? Um, by right, it's just one. So so they are pretty still looking to one test case. Yes, correct. Uh, it's one test function. Mm. They do not require additional information in this case. No, they don't. Okay. Okay, so um, so now I will dive into the probabilistic model itself, which is um, yeah, is the this probabilistic model. So um, 
So, okay, firstly, when we get the sequence of code just now, like the eight lines of code, we can actually view the eight lines of code as a sequence. And from there, um, there exists a subsequence because like just now we have line three, line four, line seven, line eight, which would uh, allow us to get a negative test case as well. So the, the idea behind this problem is still viewing the input as a sequence. And then we just want to find a subsequence that allows the test function to pass. So it's still the whole concept of uh, Delta debugging. Uh, it's still the main goal of Delta debugging, which is to make the resulting code as lean as possible. Yeah. So um, in a similar function, in this case, the, the set that we are interested in is uh, n-dimensional Boolean space, where n is the number of, number of lines in the sequence itself. So it, this is a Boolean space because um, n can take the the n dimensions can be either one or zero, where one means that the i element is included in the subsequence, and zero just means that it's excluded from the subsequence. So yeah, uh, is this part clear? So essentially, um, mm. x which is a subsequence. Yeah, so so basically, yeah. this is a search problem. So Correct. maybe you can raise a question: What is the search space? How large is the search space? Giving this um, problem formulation. Uh, How large is? Yeah. How large is the search space? Suppose we now there's uh, the the length of sequence is n, right? Yeah. And uh, by right we can brute force all the possibility of the sequence. Right. For example, zero zero one 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 and one zero zero one, etc. So here are questions for the audience. If you're interested, is that what is the uh, search space? Giving this problem formulation. Hmm. Uh, uh, anyone? Yeah, anyone would like to have a try? On. Um, um, yeah, uh, anyone? Okay, so maybe somewhere you can point one. Okay, um, maybe Xiang Ling. Yeah, do you know? Uh, uh, what the, mm. uh, maybe uh, two to the power of n. Yeah, I, I think that is mm. correct. Yeah. Yeah. So the, correct. and this is actually the theoretical of a bound mm. of, of the data debugging. So if the data debugging would like to be hundred percent complete, and the 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 data debugging have to on uh, look into all the search space, but anyway, it is not realistic. So all the data debugging approach and algorithm are designed to minimize or to improve the search efficiency with kind of sacrifice of the accuracy. Mm. Mm. Okay, let's keep going on. Yeah, yeah sure. So um, another, so one way of representing this is um, in this form, whereby it's, uh, it's a so-called a tuple of Boolean value, so whether one or zero. Alternatively, another way of um, defining it is that we only, we store the, we store we only store the index of the values that are included. So for example, if this is one, zero, one, then we will store one and, and something like that. Yeah, so uh, both, both ways are valid ways to um, represent this, but uh, I believe that the, the method, the representation below is um, favored because it allows us to have set operators. Like for example, we can make use of subsets and things like that. So I have to find a valid subsequence. Yeah, so we will be mainly yeah. using- this. One small comment is, is that uh, the set operator can also turn into the uh, all operation, all operator and operator, etc. Yeah. So if we keep a sequence of the, but of course it depends on uh, the representation space. So if we want to have a full rep representation space, suppose the sequence is, is very, very long, for example, 1 million, and of course, we can using these set representations for 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 more efficient space usage, right? Mm. But if the if the sequence is not that long, and then just a, so the set operation can be just converted into the n and all interpreting uh, operators on those bit vector. Okay, let's keep going on. Yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, so um, 
So moving on in, so there's just the, this part here is just a representation of their search space itself, as well as uh, how they represent it. Yeah. So moving on onto the model itself, the probabilistic model itself. So uh, there are actually two assumptions that they made for the design of the model. And they argue that these assumptions uh, are only meant for designing the model. It doesn't actually affect the, it doesn't affect the, it doesn't affect the accuracy of the model itself. Yeah, so the first assumption that they make is that um, if a test case X fails the test function, then any subsequence of X will also fail the test function. So um, this is, uh, uh, valid. This is while this might not be exactly valid, because maybe there are certain paths in uh, X, if there are certain subsequence of X that doesn't go through that path, then it might not, it might um, pass the test function. But I think the idea is because um, if, yeah, you wouldn't um, start, you wouldn't start off with a X that already fails the test function. Um, sorry, so may I have, do I have a, so then to, if X fails the test, test function, and a super mm. sequence of X fails it, or the sub -sequence. Uh, subsequence. Subsequence. Mm. The uh, super really, but, sequence, super so sequence can, is a larger. Uh, we can think about it. suppose mm. the the problem lies in a sub a, a sub sequence, right? Mm. And uh, if we uh, add one more um tokens into this sequence, and this this sequence will still fail the test case, but right, it's supposed to be there, right? Because because the root cause and the problem, the ring leaders inside the sub sequence. And I'm not sure. So, but your point is that if this subsequence failed it, and if we remove any part of the uh, tokens in the subsequence, and the new subsequence or the smaller subsequence can still fail the test case, uh, what if we, we remove the uh, ring leader or root cause? Then mm -hmm. that subsequence will now pass the. Will now, yeah. Yeah, um, correct. So I think um, this. This is an assumption that is made. Um, personally, I think why they are. Yeah, they did not really explain this part here. They are just saying that this is a assumption that they are making. Okay, uh, maybe we can maybe yeah. we can put this aside um, first. My my hmm. understanding is because if X already failed the test function, you wouldn't need to put it through the delta debugging. So in this case, when we say it fails the test function, it means that um, phi x is equal to false, correct? So it doesn't mean that it fails the test case. Maybe if we are doing from a debugging perspective, we want a x that fails oh, the oh, test so case. Maybe, so maybe, maybe, maybe the, the, your point is that hmm. we want, so given test case fail, right? Yes. We want to find the a, a, a minimum core or, or the, the smallest the super sequence of x hmm. and to fail it. Yeah, uh, in a sense, it's more of that. Yeah, it, if uh, they will only be interested in x that pass the test function, that, that's my um, view of it. Yeah. Yeah, so I um, just feel that maybe if x passing the test case, so yeah. any super sequence of x may pass the test case. So, so it depends. Dep so it, de it depends on what events were interested, right? Mm, yes. Mm, okay, let's keep going on. Mm, okay, and the second thing is uh, unambiguity, which means that if two subsequences uh, passes the test function, then their intersection will pass the test function. So I guess mm -hmm. here um, it, it might not be very clear, but I, I believe that the two subsequences from a sequence itself. Mm. Yeah. Mm, I think that we, it will be a bit more... Um, it will okay. be a bit more apparent, yeah. So these are just two assumptions that uh, they are making for this design itself. So uh, yeah, this, this part here is uh, another definition. Uh, it's a very simple definition, which is that give, uh, it's, it's, just an, it's just rephrasing delta debugging again, which is that given the existence of an optimal subsequence, we just want to identify all the elements in the optimal subsequence. So that is the goal of the data debugging uh, rephrase. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, um, so by making use of this, what they did is that they actually assign uh, each, uh, they assign each uh, element at index 
i, a Bernoulli random variable. So in this case, it can take either zero or one. So for this part here, I believe that their um, representation is not the set representation that we have, but more of the n boolean representation that we have. So uh, they assign the elements here a random variable theta i. And the probability of this theta i being equal to one is a, is a probability, it's a pi, because this is a random variable. So the model itself is actually uh, made up oh. of and yeah, I, I got probability. it. So, so here, why they choosing the Bernoulli random variable? So somehow we have already defined the distribution of the uh, random variable, right? Uh, sorry, yeah, can, maybe maybe the Bernoulli. By the way, the Bernoulli is just assuming the the probability between uh, the probability of zero or one is fifty percent. Am I right? Somehow my memory is fading for the Bernoulli. Yeah, Bernoulli is uh, either zero or one. Yeah. Mm. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm talking about the probability. I mean, the distribution. The probability? Distribution, yeah. The Bernoulli, and for Bernoulli random variables, and it means that, suppose we have only one random variable, it means that uh, the, the value of either zero or one is 50%. Uh, no. Not, uh, doctor. Can you repeat uh, that again? Uh, Sorry, yeah. My point is that suppose we have a random variable, mm. a Boolean random variable. This value yes. will be either zero or one, and if this random variable is a Bernoulli random variable, and we're saying that uh, its value, the value of zero or one, is fifty percent. Uh, okay. no, not exactly. Okay, not yeah. exactly. And how do yeah. they define the probability distribution? So as in uh, the probability distribution. So that, uh, I mean, the only thing about Bernoulli, what, the only thing that is defined for Bernoulli random variable is that it's either zero or one. And mm. um, because of that, there is the formula whereby it, it can be, um, mm. yeah, then there is a probability of it being one, which is P, and then the probability of it being zero will be just one minus P. Mm. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and how for, and how, do, how do how do you want, how do we define the p? Yeah. So this p is actually um this p over here. Yeah. Um. At the okay. So for the model itself, uh, at the starting phase, p is set to a random parameter. Then after that, they will update this p. I, I got, got it. Got it. So so anyway, so 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 the p is actually hyperparameters for yes, it's the hyperparameter the, for, for this. Distribution. Okay. Sorry, my memory is a bit uh, fitting. Uh, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, no, uh, it's the P is a hyperparameter at the start. Yeah. Then after that, it will be updated. So this is where the probability comes into play. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Can. So yeah, essentially, uh, you can think of the model as um, uh, n dimension of probabilities. Yeah. Where the probability correlates to whether it's uh, when it's equal to one. Yeah. So um, just a recap on the mathematical part actually um this paper is they are, they bring in a lot of um, probability concepts but actually the actual algorithm is quite straightforward yeah mm. so this part yeah, of course, they need to, of to, course they, mm. when paper writing in terms of paper writing yeah. we need to make a look thing to uh have more formulas but actually mm. the intuition so is supposed to be straightforward yeah correct so okay the another assumption that they made is that the random variables, the theta itself, are all mutually independent. Yeah, so this is um, uh, assumption. It is so still a very strong assumption, right? Yes, uh, it, it, that's why it does not seem very sound to me. Uh, but that's maybe because I do not, uh, maybe I, I do not have a good grasp of the delta debugging approach right now. Uh, the, point is that, the point is that if these two variables have data hmm. country dependency, so they're these two random variables cannot be independent. Yes. Right. So, so the probability of one line to be buggy will actually be somehow relevant and propagated yes. to the other line. Yeah. But I believe that um, why they make this assumption is because, for example, if we look at um, Chisel, Chisel itself actually takes into consideration the the dependencies. Yeah, control uh, so their flow, right? Maybe they would already that would be a subsequence. It would be a sequence on its own. Yeah. Mm, okay. So I think this is the assumption that they make. Um, it's not a 
it's uh it doesn't sound very sound to me but uh maybe that's what i could understand from that yeah mm. so okay uh now moving on to the probability aspect of it so in this case um following what we have over here where it's um where it's a Bernoulli random variables with um probability of p1 of pi to be uh one so the probability of a vector x being equal to the optimal vector x star is the um, product of all the probabilities. Yeah. So um, in the case over here, xi, xi is um, 1 or 0. Whether the, whether the, whether the uh, statement is in the subsequence itself. So if it's in the subsequence, it's 1. If not, it's 0. So we can see that if, uh, if it's in the subsequence, then it takes pi. If it's not in the subsequence, then it just takes 1 minus pi. So this um, part here is just a simple product of the probabilities of um, x being equal to x star. Yeah. Uh, any questions up to here? I, I know this part here might seem a bit um, complicated because there are a few assumptions going on. And yeah, there's a bit of probability going on. Mm. Mm. Um, Okay. Yeah, I, I have no problem here. Any yeah. questions for uh, the formulation? So basically, I think one of the very, very important novelties that they convert the Dirt debugging search into a problem of the uh, Bernoulli. Yeah, yeah. Each each line or each token have been are uh, become a Bernoulli random variables, mm. so that they will have a probability formulation there. Yes. <clears throat> mm. Yeah, so um, this delta debugging process or this probability delta debugging will stop when pi uh, is equal to 0 or 1. So 0 means that uh, it's definitely not included and 1 means that it's definitely included. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm. And um, yeah, so the probability of x, which is a uh, vector x passing the test case, is the probability that no element in x star is excluded. So, um, X star, X star in this case is the optimal, the most optimal subsequence. So it's the shortest subsequence that will pass the test case. So the probability of a sequence, of a subsequence passing the test case is the probability that it has uh, all the elements in X star. So in this case, I think it will be easier to think of it as uh, the set representation itself instead of the Boolean representation. And the probability of X passing the test case is if x star is a subset of x. Yeah. Mm. Mm. And then because of that, because we are only interested in uh, those that are x, uh, no element in x star is excluded from x, then we just need to look at those that are excluded. Yeah. Mm. Mm. OK. OK, then. Um, so this is just a probabilistic model instead. It's just. Um, so actually, while it, this part here is just going to the details, actually, you can think of the probabilistic model. The one takeaway from the probabilistic model is that it's just, um, it's just a so-called n-dimension um, data structure that stores all the probability. Yeah, so this is the probabilistic model. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. I'm and, sorry. Yeah, yeah, sure. Can, Go ahead. Can, can I ask what, what hmm. is the value of xi and 1 minus xi? What? Oh, um, so x. Xi is um whether it's in the whether it's in okay, so xi is whether the variable, the, the variable at index i is in the vector x. So xi can only take two values, either zero or one. So if this is zero, then uh we cancel pi. If it's oh, one, then we cancel yeah. the so, so the algorithm basically is going to on um, search a set of pi, right? <clears throat> so as long as we define uh, mm. p is equals to 0 and 1 or 0 0.9 or 0 0.8. Yes. Uh, and, and of course, here you're saying that the data the, debugging, the evidence stops when all the pi is equal to either 0 or 1. Zero or one. Yes, correct. So once we have decided this, reach these conditions, and mm. we have found a, a, an optimal subsequent there. Yes, correct. Because uh, all the, all those in, all those pi's, all those um statements with pi equal one will be included and all those with zero will be excluded so that's the most optimal case yeah mm. okay uh I, I i would have a few examples later on to run through it again so um if it's a bit unclear maybe that would help to clarify your doubts 
but uh, essentially the the whole takeaway is the model how the model looks like yeah and um so the prior distribution as mentioned just now um is uniformly set to some sigma where sigma is between zero and one so how to actually select this hyperparameter is um normally they use the reduction ratio which is um the optimal over the entire subsequence the length how, of the how, optimal yeah so this but, is so, empirical right the, the, right, the, the module of x star is a very mm. empirical Yes, because uh, this this isn't known. If this is known, then uh, this this uh, tool is not valid, or this model is not valid. Uh, it's not needed. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I think the thing is that um, after that, in their experiments itself, they actually tried out with multiple reduction ratios. So it need not actually be um, it need not exactly follow this value. This is just a guide. Yeah, but um. In their experiments itself, they actually tried out with different um sigma itself. Yeah. And they show that the accuracy or the effectiveness doesn't isn't really affected much by this sigma. Yeah. Okay. So it is just uh some random values. Yeah. The only thing uh I think that is important is that uh it's uniformly set because at the start of the program itself, all statements should have equal probability of being included and excluded. Because uh, we assume that there's no knowledge known about the program itself. Mm. Okay. So uh, now moving on. So that's the probabilistic model itself. So moving on to updating the model itself. So uh, this slide here is also very probabilistic. Uh, there's a lot of probability concepts inside, but uh, it's actually uh, quite straightforward as well. Yeah. So um, the idea for updating the model is that uh, we want to update the probability of theta i being equal to one given all the past test cases. So the test cases consist of, um, so a test itself is the event where uh, you test x i and you get back a result r i. So a test itself is made up of, you can think of it as a pair, which is that you take in the x, where x is the subsequence that you have, and then you get back a result, whether R is true or false. Yeah, so what this um, part here they are trying to do is that they are calculating whether theta, the probability that theta I is equal to one, given um, all the past test cases that has happened. Uh, yeah. Sorry, so we mm -hmm. once have a question whether their their debugging relies on one test cases or multiple test cases. Yes. In this case, it seems that uh, this approach, assuming there's a multiple test cases for us to use, uh no, there is one test function, but multiple subsequences that are going into that one. Okay, test so case. xi is yeah. basically a subsequence. Xi is a subsequence. Okay, so, okay. the test yeah. means a subsequence. Okay. Mm, mm, okay, yeah. so this test is basically a, a a test in statistical meaning. Test input. Yeah. Mm. Mm. So yeah. So uh, sorry if that, that part isn't very. Clear. Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. But... So uh, so thanks for the verif uh, clarification. Yeah. No worries. No. So um, because of that, yeah, so this is a conditional probability. Uh, I think it's very obvious that there is some problems with this method, which is that um, calculating of this T1 to Tn will be very time consuming. Yeah, mm -hmm. so um, one way to do it is, okay, so the most straightforward way is to actually enumerate the entire set of subsequence and sum up the probability. But um, this method, as I mentioned, is very time consuming. So they would, uh, they actually decided to go with another method. Um, let me see. If I have it. Okay. Uh, yeah. Maybe I go into a bit more details here first. So just take note that this method, because it makes use of all the test cases, uh, is quite time consuming. Yeah. So um, so when they introduce a new concept over here the concept of consistency. Uh, this concept is a bit different, or at least my understanding of it is a bit different from our normal consistency. So uh, normally we take consistency as whether the new input passes the test case as well. So if that is, if it passes the test case, then that is consistent. But um, for their definition of consistent, we can see that um, they do not really care about whether the, whether X, passes the test case. 
instead what they want to check is whether x is optimal yeah so this definition um seems a bit i, I do not know if it's a typo on their part whether this should be x instead but um it it seems a bit funny because it seems as though they are not interested in whether x passes the test case yeah uh dr lin do you have any uh, yeah, idea so or you, uh, yeah. You, yeah, I don't have no comments on it at this hmm. moment. Yeah, okay. Uh, because this part here, uh, definitely, uh, it took me a while to understand because their idea of consistency, I think, is a bit different. Yeah. Okay, but uh, so essentially for this part here, what they do um is they check whether the new subsequence is consistent with um all the previous so-called test cases, and to check whether it's consistent they use this um, consistent prime, where consistent prime is, um, so okay, a test case, X prime and R is a test case T. So as mentioned previously, we can think of each test case as a, as a pair, where the first element is the test, the test input, and the second element is the output. So um, the idea is that this X is only consistent with a test case if, um, all the sorry this right here if all the um if all the variables or if all the statements in x prime that are excluded are also excluded in x then that is it's a uh, yeah then for r equal true if so if the sorry if the result is true then they check to make sure that all the so so maybe, mm -hmm. maybe uh, let me further confirm so yeah. we want to find a optimal or the minimum set of x star Correct. which make the test which makes the result fail right mm -hmm. fail yes. or, or t, t, uh, the result so we were interested in the uh, r equals to t or r equals r equals to f yes Correct. So, R, uh, R, 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 sorry, let me confirm. R equals T or R equals F. So we want to be very clear on this part for, mm. for us to further understand so, this. Okay, yeah. So if R equal T, so R is a, a variable over, it's a, it's a result. So if it passes the test case, then it uh, goes through the first statement. If it mm. fails the test case, then it goes to the second statement. So we are interested in the events when R is equal to F, right? Uh, no, right now, what we are interested in is that it's consistent with all the test cases, all the test cases that has um, occurred previously. So the test cases might have multiple results. Okay, maybe T is very um, T is very ambiguous because I realized that there are actually multiple T's, but the T in this case here is true or false, mm. correct? And um, the T in this case is a test case. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I got, I got it. Mm. I got so, um, yeah, okay. Uh, so what happens is that if if R is true, then they would, uh, they need to make sure that for X, it, okay. So th this is two separate um conditions, right? So if we only look at the top half, for cases where R is true, then uh all the all variables that has been excluded from x primes should be excluded from x as well. Mm. Uh, that, so that, that is the only way for it to be optimal because it will be smaller than x prime. Yeah, so it means the increase in number, increase the in number of xi equals to zero, right? We want to increase. So the rationale is that we want to have to change one x uh, in from one to zero. Is that your point? One x from one. Uh, x, uh, uh, switch xi from one to zero means that we exclude one xi. Mm. Okay, yeah, so if we exclude one xi, correct. If xi mm. changes from one to zero, we are excluding a uh, one xi. Yeah, mm. we are excluding xi, correct. So. Uh, over here, they are only interested in all the XIs that have been excluded, and they want to make sure that all XIs that have been excluded previously are also excluded oh. in the new XI. Mm -hmm. Then in that case, then it's considered consistent. But in the case of whereby R is false, then uh, for any of the XI that uh, have been excluded, 
should still be excluded. Yeah, one, yeah, one, uh, no, for any of the XI that were excluded, then one of them should be equal to one. Okay, um, um, yeah, okay, um, let me clear the screen a bit. Okay, so, uh, if we only focus at the, the top half is clear, right? Mm. Which is that, uh, we are only interested in all the statements that have been excluded in X, big X prime. And for all those statements that have been excluded in big X prime, they should also be excluded in X. Mm. Right. So let me come let, let, let me confirm. Mm. Maybe I, I, I get a little bit confused here. Yeah, sure. So the ultimate goal here is that uh, once we now, assuming that we now and the subsequence X is optimal, right? Yes. So so if this subsequence makes a test um fail. So mm -hmm. it means that um, if we reduce any of the, if we further minimize this X and uh, the result will be turning to true. And uh, if the result is true, it means that it's still not optimal. So we're trying to, um, yeah, uh, sorry, sorry, Xianghui, can, can you mm. go back? So start with, can we go through these slides from the very beginning? So okay, we start sure. with, oh, no, 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 uh, no, not here. So here is quite clear about the uh, right. Oh, uh, so, start so, from so, here again. Yeah, start from here. So, okay, sure. so maybe I, I'm trying to understand, interpret mm. uh, the points and you can correct me if I'm wrong. Okay, sure. Uh, the idea is that, so they have a lot of the combination of the XI, right? So there's yes. a lot of the superset of the X. And we yes. want to find the minimum subset of X so that uh, the test result is fail. Um, test result is, by right, test result is passed. Mm. Test result is true, uh, not false. So, so true means that some events we are interested in happens. Yes, yes. Okay. So, so that event that we are interested in can be like, it takes a certain path or that a certain test case fails. Yeah. It, Maybe okay, okay. Oh, mean so here t equals to true means the test cases has been failed, right? So, a, I, yes, in a sense, okay, yeah. okay, okay, okay. So, in this case, so anyway, when the r equals t, it means that mm. something we something we are interested happens. So, yeah, we want correct. so basically the delta, delta debugging is going to find as a minimum subset which mm. can still incur the events we're still we're interested, right? Yes. Okay, yes. so now we're talking about, we, we hear the concepts of consistency. Yes. So uh, an X is consistency with a test case and mm. the test result. So basically the test result is, uh, include, is, is, is consists of X prime and uh, R, right? Yes. R, right, right. So, so we, we, we have a definition of how X is consistent with this uh, test result T. And here on uh, you're saying that if the consistency depends on on phi uh phi x prime is equal to r, how to interpret this term? Uh sorry, which part of the uh oh okay. So uh no, okay. That's why um I highly suspect that there are this definition might be mm. not correct. But uh, I'm not too sure because I double checked the paper multiple times and uh, it's X prime. Yeah. Yeah, I think I have I was some understanding it should be about X. this. Yeah, hello. Mm, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Go ahead. Yeah. I think basically you have an X prime. Mm. And if you fit it into your facts, you will get test result R. Yes. But this X prime is not optimal. So you want to find an optimal one, which you call X. Yeah, and this x should have the same testing result as x prime. Mm. Right, so that's the so actually phi x should also be equal to r. Yeah, yeah. So this r can be either true or false. Yeah, correct. It doesn't matter. It's just you want to find x which produce consistent mm. result as x prime. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, that's why I think this should just be phi x equal to r. Right. I'm not too sure. Yeah, but. Uh, I thought I think I think this is a very good explanation. Mm -hmm. So on on here, so the next two bullets are talking about yes. and, and how do we find the consistency of X? Yes. 
Mm. And basically, I think the ultimate goal is that we still we keep updating the probability of each random variable, right? Yeah, correct. And and here we want to talk about how the update is conducted. Um, maybe we can maybe we can keep going on. So yeah, for the consistency, uh, I think the consistency is um not that important to the algorithm itself. It helps them to come up with like their formulation of this. But um, it's not, I would say it's not very important because the, the ultimate algorithm is just like that. Yes. Maybe you can keep going and we mm. can put the confusion aside and we okay, can pick sure. up this. So and anyway, so here, right, by the way, so here, so given mm. X, given, given a few tests, given a, te given a few tests, the probability of the uh, theta i equals to one, is defined based on the consistency, the concept of consistency, right? The probability that ti is equal to one. Okay, maybe the consistency is used to optimize uh, or, or, or narrow down the search space. Um, the consistency is, yeah, it's, I think it's mainly used to just help in this calculation. Yeah. Mm. Mm, I'm not exactly and, and the sure. consistency. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, the consistency mm. is basically the count the function of com, mm. and the the return value of com is either zero or one. Yes, correct. Mm. So whether it's consistent or not. Mm. So whether the x is consistent or not. Yeah. Mm. So when when x i is consistent, um, so it, its probability will be kept otherwise it will be removed is that the point mm, so it, um, um mm. when x i is you can see this is um, consistency value right mm, yeah so suppose given an x so it's here suppose here the n x i so it means that given x i x i will basically will have a is either zero or one right x i is either zero or one yes so if yes. x even so if even x i is one and if it's not consistent that, with, uh, it's... with a given a given set of tests, mm. and we still not call it, so that's yes, uh... correct. Yes, correct. So if it's not consistent, it would be zero. The whole statement would be zero. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Okay. Mm. Mm, um. Maybe. Yeah. Doctor, maybe if you are interested, mm. we can have a more in-depth discussion on this. Sure, uh, sure. And no problem. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think there's a way to narrow down the search space, so we don't bother mm. to go through all the combination. Correct. But we're just going to find the uh, subset which is just consistent with uh, uh, existing mm. test result. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, thanks for final show for the explanation of the first statement. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So um, the as mentioned. Previously, this is a very huge search space itself. So uh, there's no efficient solver to, do, to solve it actually. So because of that, they actually um, calculate the probability after every test instead of on across all the tests. So actually that's why this part on consistency, um, it's, it helps in the understanding, but maybe, uh, maybe I didn't do a very good job explaining it. But essentially um, we are to reduce how much we have to calculate, they are actually assuming that each test is independent. And because of that, because each test is independent, then you can calculate it in uh, after each test instead. Yes. Uh, any questions? Okay, I have no yeah. further question here. Yeah, okay. So yeah, this is just uh, uh, updating the model. So now uh, down to the actual updating of the model itself. So um, maybe, we might have lost track, but the the model, as we mentioned previously, is just a array or data structure of all the probabilities, whether it's included mm -hmm. or excluded from the optimal uh, optimal subsequence. So, given a given a subsequence where x i is equal to one, okay, this is a lemma that they came up with. Um, the proof for this is um omitted. Yeah, uh, I I omitted the proof of this because uh it doesn't it's not really important but essentially what they are saying is that uh given x where x i is equal to one which means x i is included whether or not the test pass or sphere is independent of the theta i itself yeah um 
yeah, if you are interested in the proof for this, it's a very short proof. Uh, it can be found in the paper itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is the lemma that they are going on. And based on this lemma, actually, so here we have the we have the rules that we are interested in. Yeah. So okay, uh, I think they they were very detailed in uh how they derived these rules. Uh, so but essentially we can compose decompose it to these three steps. Uh. So if um if the i element is in x, then pi is unchanged. So the probability is unchanged. So because if the element itself is within x, we are not too sure whether it actually contributes to passing or failing the test case. So this line one is actually, I believe, from this um lemma itself. We assume that there, there's no um, relationship between the I element. Yeah, so um, you, you can think of it as, let's say I have a statement that is within this subsequence X. Whether or not that statement is um, required or not is independent of the result itself. Because for example, if this statement is, uh, this statement can be a necessary statement or it might just be a statement there and it, you cannot actually tell whether it's a necessary statement or a statement that is just in the block until you exclude it. So because of that, only statements that are excluded will get updated and statements that are included would not have their probability updated. Yeah, uh, I, I hope this is clear. Mm, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, if, if this is not clear, I can uh, run through with the previous example that we had. Then, um, the second thing is that if, um, if let's say I exclude an element from the subsequence and the test passes, what I can be sure of is that the element that is excluded is not relevant. And therefore, the probability of it being included in the optimal, um, sense, optimal subsequence is zero. Yeah, so this I think is pretty straightforward because uh, if the test passes, that means you are, the element itself is not needed. Yeah, and the last one is to update the probability itself. So um, the probability is updated um, using this formula. So um, the, the reason behind this formula is also in the, in the proof itself. It's um, building off the fact. It's actually building off um, what we were discussing just now on consistency. Yeah, but essentially if, um, if an element is excluded from the, from the subsequence and the test fails, we know that this element might have an uh, impact on the test. Yes. So basically it's trying to update the weights, up weighting update the, the, yeah, update up the weighting, yeah, up weighting the probability. And yes, two, right. so, so, so basically it will try to iterating or keep sampling the, the, the space, keep sampling yes. the, the, the so-called tests in the space until all the PIs will be either zero or one. So zero, yes. So, so to have they to have they do they have any guarantee that, on um, they can achieve, uh, the convergence within certain iteration. Uh, within a certain iteration, I think, uh, the the speed of convergence. So it, uh, actually it might not. Mm. I don't think they have that guarantee. Yeah, because mm. um, their their program do. So they can do. They, maybe like they can evaluate this giving the evaluation. Mm. For an experiment. Okay, let's keep going on. Uh, okay. Yeah, sure. yeah, the one is on. Okay, let's keep going on. Okay, sure. Yeah, so uh, then, the, okay, so after we have a way to update the model as well as, uh, okay, so after we have run through the probability model, which is a uh, data structure and a way to update the probabilities in the model, now we need to um, make use of this probability to find the next subsequence. And um, this part here is, the concept of um, gain. So how much can you gain from including a particular element into the, into the subsequence? So the gain of a test is, um, is actually calculated based on, okay, the gain of a test is calculated based on the difference between the, the difference in the elements between the current sequence and the previously passing sequence. Yeah, so essentially it's just, um, for example, in our case where there are eight, um, where there are eight statements initially, and if I only take, in my new subsequence, I only take six statements, then there is a, I gain, I have a gain of two. Yeah, so it's just the difference in size between the previous and the, 
next uh the previous and the current mm. yeah. by the way so i have another question so yeah, sure. when they initialize the probability uh whether the sum of all the probability would be equals to one uh no it's not equal to one it's yeah. not because equal uh, to because one. each of the elements are in independent i see because um yeah oh, yeah, yeah yeah you're yeah. right you're right you're right mm. Mm. Okay, because ultimately it will not be equal to one okay yeah so uh this is the idea of gain so the gain is uh, based on that and the expected gain is um the based on that as well as whether the test what's the probability of the test case passing so because if the test case doesn't pass then technically um, you do not gain anything yeah okay mm -hmm. so this is how they calculated their gain um yeah oh, by so the way so if we do not the test case does not passing or at least we can remove something right in terms of information again um if the test case does not pass we we can somehow shouldn't we just uh, turn down their prob probability okay we will turn up the probability of those that were excluded so if the test case um does not pass we can turn up the probability of those that were excluded but we do not turn down the probability of those that were included yeah so if you are included your probability doesn't change but if you are excluded then your probability will change yes mm. yeah i understand so this is very sensitive to change from passing to to failure mm. but anyway so suppose the test case is already failure had already been a failure so whatever we do so so this is more like so what we are learning right so suppose we want to um be successful in terms of maybe phd application uh, paper accept acceptance or startup whatever it is we want mm -hmm. to gain access so if we keep trying we keep failure we, we keep getting we keep having the negative feedback so basically we're not learning anything basically yeah. is it, so this uh, is what what do you want to say no uh we are learning that so so okay. we keep we keep failing I mean, i'm i'm saying that we're we keep got the feedback of failure so uh, basically failure yeah i x equal f yeah the point yeah so we keep mm. getting failure so 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 we get we have no information again there unless we can we can we can learn something unless we we, we turn from the failure to test to pass or or turn from the past to failure hello yeah yeah uh let me think about that unless we can turn um so given a given an x right so mm. suppose we have some change for an x to x prime right yes and a test case turn either we have an information gain either from t to f or f to t yes ah yes correct then mm. in uh also actually if we go from x to x prime mm. and we go from t to t Mm. what we can guarantee is that whatever we excluded are not needed mm. so for yeah, example you're, you're, yeah. right, you're right right so yeah, the only so, the only the only situations or scenarios we cannot get information is when we are f to f to f so we yes, cannot correct. we cannot update the model mm. yes correct mm. okay yeah so um this is just how they select the subsequences so um yeah, so there is actually a. There's somehow is this, is this somehow a mutation? So given an X, we change the X prime, we do some mutations or we reduce some, 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 some elements or add some elements, or they just pick up a, just a random X in the pool. Um, sorry, you can you say that again? Yeah. So I mean, that how to derive an X? Suppose I know X is passing or failure, right? And, mm. and and my question how do we derive another x prime to have to maximize the probability to have the information gain to maximize uh this expected gain is yeah it? yes okay so um the thing is actually if you look at this equation right so x um, means difference right the ex yeah the difference. ex is the difference between um these two so the number yeah the number of elements excluded between x and xt so xt um means 
XT is a, is a input that has already passed. And it's the previous input that has already passed. The most recent, the so-called smallest input that has already passed to now. It might not be the most optimal, but it's the most optimal for now. Mm. Mm. So uh, over here, we can see that, of course, if X, EX increases, uh, our expected gain will increase. But then at a point, um, probability, this probability will also start to fall. Because the more elements that we exclude from here, the more likely it is that we will fail the test case. Correct? Mm. Yeah, so actually, um, the, uh, there is actually an analysis of it. So the more elements that we actually exclude past a certain point, there's actually, uh, it starts to fall. The, the gain actually starts to fall because the, this probably- We keep, we keep getting the negative mm. feedback, right? Yes, yes, correct. Mm. So there is a so-called optimal uh, amount to decide. And this uh, optimal is calculated based on, yeah, based on this function. Yes. Mm. Okay. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Um. Okay. So. Uh, yeah. Essentially, that's it for the graph itself. Um. Yeah. So since X T is the last subsequence that passed the test, so what we do is that we just sort all the elements in X T, um, in an ascending manner based on their probability. So a higher probability means that it's more likely to be kept in the sequence, and a lower probability means it's less likely to be kept in the sequence then we exclude the elements in order until the expected gains um, begin to decrease. Then from there, we can return the subsequence with the highest expected gain. Yeah. Mm, okay. Okay. So uh, this, this is also pretty um, clear cut. Yeah. So uh, over here, we have the same example again. So um, we start off with all of them being 0 0.25. So um, this is just random. It's arbitrary, uh, arbitrary values. And then, uh, okay, so over here, we are actually running through a so-called model example that was given by, by the authors itself. Yeah. Um, so why I say this is a model example is because there is, a, there is a component of randomness that's required and they assume the best, so-called the best case. This is a best case example. So over here, okay, let's um, trace through. Uh, it, in the initial phase, um, you include all the statements and therefore this is a valid, valid sub, this is a valid subsequence. And all of them have the same probability. Then over here, because they all have the same probability, uh, how do you actually select your subsequence? So over here, you actually select based on randomness. So how you actually, uh, so in this case, let's assume that they selected S1, S2, and S5, and S6. So if you only include this, four lines, you actually um, fail the test case. So those, those statements that were excluded, you will notice their probability increased based on the prob updating probability that we had previously. Yeah. Then um, because now their probability is higher, they will be included in the, they will be included instead. And the S1, S2, S5, and X6 will be excluded. And this is a valid, um, valid test case. And because of that, um, S1, S2, S5, and S6 will have their probability reduced to zero. Yeah. So um, the reason why I think this is a model example is not very um, accurate because yeah, they, they make it so nicely that, um, yeah, they make it so nicely that it just coincides correctly. Yeah. Um, so actually I have a, example that is a bit less um, so-called perfect. So over here, we, we, I think it's better for us to just run through the not so perfect test case. So assuming now instead of selecting the lines, maybe they selected S4 to S7. So after you select S4 to S7, this test case fail. Then after that, they select um, S1 to S8 because these are the uh, these are the statements with the highest probabilities. Mm. And this is also a test case that fails because uh, you, you need line four and line seven as well. So after you get that, uh, then you calculate the gain again. So you calculate the gain again, and maybe this time you only need to eliminate two statements. So over here, 
there is because all of them have the same probability again uh, the selection of these statements are now still at random so yeah they, then you just uh, yeah so if they manage to select randomly the two statements to be excluded and you get the remaining uh, statements that pass. Yeah. So uh, S2, S3, S4 would pass along with S6, S7, and S8. Then S1 and S5 will have their probability drop to zero based on our probabilistic model mentioned previously. Yeah. So after that, uh, you can exclude two more statements again. So in this case, maybe they exclude S2 and S7. So S2 and S7. So S7 is actually relevant in our test case. And because S7 is not included, this will be a failing test case. So uh, the probability of S2 and S7 will increase. Yeah, then after that, uh, it's just a process of going through them again until their probability are all the same. Then you reduce again. You reduce the number of statements that you select. Yeah. And then, uh, so yeah, actually what the example just shows is that um, for cases where if you exclude it, how you update the probability is just to set it to zero. And then for cases where you exclude it and it's a false test case, then the probability increases. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. I have no pro question here. Any questions for Senghui? Okay. I think the idea is really novel. Yeah. I think overall, I think this paper was the best paper award. Yes. Okay. Yeah, then uh, overall, after this is the evaluation portion. So they just compare it with DDMIN. So their way of comparing it with DDMIN is that they um they replace, for example, um, as mentioned previously, there is Chisel as well as um, HDD. So they just replace the DDMINs that are in HDD and Chisel with their new novel method PropDD instead. Yeah, then... Uh, the impact of the parameter in prop DD. So in this case, this parameter that we are talking about is actually just the starting parameter, which is the starting so-called reduction ratio. And then lastly, they compare it with uh, active coarsen, which is a search, another search um, space algorithm. Yeah. Mm. So, um, so the setup itself is that they, so uh, as mentioned, they just make use of HDD and Chisa as well. So these are the test cases, these are what they are comparing against as well as their test cases is um, selected from uh, the set of test cases that were generated for trees and um, cheese. Yeah. Then there are metrics in this case is um, the size of the produced result. So for example, for HDD and cheese, they might not actually find the smallest optimal um, set itself. So they are comparing whether PropDD is able to find a more optimal set as well as the time taken. And then uh, as well as the number of tokens deleted per second. So this number of tokens deleted per second, the reason why this was included, I believe, is because sometimes um, the processing time is too long and the program will time out. So you can only gauge based on the number of tokens deleted per second. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. So um, the for their results itself, um, for the first question, which is for the first research question, which is comparing between um, prop DD and DD mean itself, uh, we can see that overall the so okay, um, R, RP in this case, right? Uh, R represents the size of the input, and then yeah, overall there's an improvement in their version versus the D version. So RP is the size of their optimal set, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, and um, so that means uh, their approach even take an input of trees, so they by ignoring. So ignoring the tree structure, they can still have a very good performance. No. Uh, what they do is they, they still take into account the tree structure. All they did actually was to convert the part that was done using DD mean with their I got probability. It, I got it, I got it. So, so yeah, the tree structures and the dependencies, everything are still um still right. So basically their approach is complementary to all the hierarchical or yes. structural uh their debugging. Okay. Uh, yes, it's more of the their approach can be used as a new basis instead mm. of DDM. Yeah, correct. So overall, uh, there's an improvement for all their, uh, all their values. So mm. you can see that it, it actually um reduces it to a smaller size. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Then the for research question two, which is the initial probability, which is uh what Doctor Lin mentioned just now, the Sigma itself. So um, for this 
for, to calculate how this parameter actually affects, they selected 14 different um 14 different subjects. So subjects in this case is like just 14 different um program, right? Yeah, programs. And then after that, uh, out of these 14 programs, their reduction ratio, which is the sigma, actually ranges from um 0 0.005 to 0 0.89. So it does matter. So it does matter. Um, means... no, so what they are saying is that from these 14 projects, uh, some of the projects they can they they can be reduced by a large amount. Some of the projects can only be reduced by a small amount. Yeah, but for their so case... so it here. So let me repeat mm. or rephrase. So based on different initial probability sigma, and they will achieve very different reduction ratio. Ratio. No, no. Uh, what they are saying is that um over here they have you can think of it as fourteen different programs. So some of okay, the programs. So, okay, so 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 let me. So you you mean that giving different uh, subjects their their ground truth reduction ratio range, yes. ranges from zero point zero five to zero point uh, yes, eight nine nine. Mm. Yes, correct. So this is the ground truth reduction ratio. So what uh, I guess this just shows that their test the programs itself is very comprehensive. So it has all sorts of reduction ratio included. So um for their sigma itself. They actually tried out with uh, a range of values mm. and um, they use the number of tokens deleted as the metric itself. So based on their values itself, okay, we can see over here. So the red line over here is um the red line is actually the DD mean method. So the red line is always the DD mean method, and the blue line is their method. So we're trying out different um, values of the initial sigma. There is a slight, there's a slight deviation in the R itself, where R is the ratio. The, right? Yeah, ratio. There's a not not the ratio, uh, the the size of the program at the end. Okay. Okay. Mm. Yeah, the reduced the reduced program. There so is it a, means a, there, So it seems as there, it does matter, there, right? Uh, so it it mean, matters a bit. Yeah. Like maybe uh, so it means that their approach is not convergent. So hmm. it's bit anyways. It's it's a search algorithm. Yeah. So starting with different initializations, they may hmm. achieve different different results. Yes. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. But uh, their argument is that even though there is a slight deviation in their results, but um, it's always uh significantly better than the DD mean method. So hmm. because of that, uh, their method is still Better. Yeah. Yeah, correct. Uh, so essentially that's the part on the hyperparameter, which is the starting ratio. Yeah. Mm. So and, what's the left and right? What's the oh difference? okay? Uh so the left is the geometric mean and the right side is the number of tokens deleted per second. So this is the oh, got it, got it. Okay. Hmm. Correct. So uh and the last one is compared against uh active cosm, which is a search algorithm. Yeah, it's the only it's the only heuristic search approach that they were able to find. And um similarly, they also created two different versions of HDD and Chisel by replacing DD mean with the active um this uh search algorithm. And because this result is affected by randomness, because uh, as we saw just now, how you start and select your probabilities, uh your initial probability, your initial set uh will affect the runtime as well. So they actually ran it five times and they compute the average. Yeah. So uh, the reason for five times is that the standard deviation across the five runs is already less than one percent. So they assume that it's sufficient. Yeah. And overall, um, yeah, it, it also performed better than active cost. Yeah. Mm, okay. Hmm. Okay. Uh, that. It, yeah, I think it's a very clarified uh, description and presentation mm. for this best paper. And mm. I think the approach is all very, very novel. And uh, you can see if if know you know about their debuggings, and you can mm. think about how and also you can see not only the approach is novel, but but also the novelty leads to a significant performance improvement. I think that mm. is the research we would like to pursue in our follow in, in our future. Yeah. Yes. Oh, any questions for this their debugging? Um yeah, if no, let's <clears throat> let's thank Xianghui again. And uh, move to Yufan. So Yufan, I think Changsheng is not here today, right? 
Yes. So he is still, um, uh, so Changsheng is still in his quarantine, right? Uh, yes. Okay, so um, if I maybe, um, he, so he delegated you to give in the presentation. Yeah, I can. Mm. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So so let's go through this uh the session of the quantum computing. Okay. Yeah. Let's move. Share my screen. Could you see my screen? Yeah. Mm. Okay. So today I will also talk about the quantum programming. First, we have a quick quick uh review. <laughs> So you know the transistor a bit is usually stored in a classical computer using a transistor that is either you know connecting an electrical signal the high voltage is one state and or not connecting the low voltage is the zero state and a qubit is similar but it's uh, it's it's you know out of a quantum object it might be a spinning particle that can point up or down of that uh, can be polarized the vertical or you know, horizontal or quantum wire that is charged or uncharged. So much like a uh, classic basis, the two possible measurements of a qubit is also one or zero. And uh, it will assign it to a certain you know, spin or polar polarization or uh, electrical charge. And uh, an uh, isolated qubit who is, has a stable state can store a bit of information just like the classical bit. Uh, however, we can also see that here is a very, sorry, how to go to the next page. Uh, okay, so there's a, this is the difference between the classical and the qubit. The qubit actually has the, different state called superposition. The superposition means that it can also be the zero and also be the one state in the same time. And uh, it's like the, uh, like here, uh, you know, here, if we want to store the classic states on the left, we would need a set of four uh, physical classical bits to represent each one and uh, totally, you know, uh, 64 physical classical bits together. And uh, the quantum states on the right can be stored using just four physical qubits. So this is the totally different between the classical bit and the qubit. So what is the superposition, superposition state? Uh, the definition is that sometimes a state can be in a combination of two states and you can never be quite sure what what you, when you or you will mention. So you before you mention it, you will never know it is a zero or one. So here is a quick question. What do you think you will observe if you try to measure the state of this qubit? Anyone volunteer? Yeah, any volunteer for this question? Maybe Xiangling. Uh, Xiangling is, is not there. <laughs> Okay, maybe Rofan. Rofan, yeah. Rofan, uh, Rofan, Rofan, Rofan is not still there, not there. Maybe you can call him. Okay, uh, so yeah, maybe, maybe find it. Maybe Xiang Wei. Hello, Xiang Hui. Okay, maybe you find another people. <laughs> Maybe Dr. Lin, you can find another people. I can't see the people. Uh, okay, so maybe Elvin, so are you still there? Uh, yes, uh, Prof, I'm here. Yeah, so, so can you answer these questions? So given we have two, um, we have two qubits, right? No, no, only one qubit. Okay, okay, so we have one qubit. And we here's a, yeah. Text. Okay, so we have A and B in the chain. So what do you think, um, what will you observe if you want to measure the state of this qubit? Uh, measure B, because I think that actually the second state will have more information. 
Um, Kajam, please. What's... Hi, I'm, I'm Hi. Measure B. I think the answer is supposed to be either zero or one, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can mention one or the other because uh, when you mention it, it will collapse to a, a certain state. And uh, the probability is depends on the phase, depends on A and B. Uh, that's the superposition. I, I, I think we, I and Changshan, I, Changshan and I mentioned before in the last, uh, last uh, presentation. Maybe you can have a short review. Mm. Okay, so after you mentioned the qubit and I found it in one of the computational states, zero and one, it will forever be found in that state, same state. So the measurement changes state into one of the computational states and all the other information in the state is lost. So for example, here, if you mention uh, just the one, it will just uh, collapse to one. But if you uh, mention uh, you know, a combined state, a superposition state, there's some, some, you know, some possibility you will mention zero. Yes, there are also some possibility you will mention one. But if um, you mention- By the way, so does to... this two number on A and B is supposed to sum up to one? Because yeah, this, yeah, all, yeah. The, this, this is one plus D square is one. Yeah, so, um, Okay, so I'm not sure the co coefficient the coefficient looks looks correct, but anyway. Yeah, so, I have a mm. uh, fract because mm. uh, if you compute it, it will equals to one. Okay. So in here, you will find that if uh, if if you compute the loss, you will find that a uh, compute the total probability. You will find that mostly under this coefficient you have 99% to collapse to one. So uh, this is the, you know, the relationships between the probability and the coefficients. And uh, you can also see that the coefficients also can be, you know, imaginary number. It's not needed to be uh, just a, 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 a real number. It can be complex number. But it is still, you know, fulfills the requirements that the two, you know, two, co two coefficient square equals to some square equals a square sum equals to one. Hmm. Okay. And uh, I do remember this this uh, signal. This signal means that uh, sorry. This signal means that this signal means that uh, is in the one state. So in matrix, it's like that. Okay. And uh, these are all only one qubit here. These are only one qubit. It also can be in the one, uh, zero state, it also can be in the one state. Okay. So if uh, we also show in the last presentation, we also show that uh, it can also on a sphere. It's called a blotch uh, representation. And uh, remember, we talk about this for this for uh, this for signal. The one means that uh, it is in the zero state. Uh, the zero, this one means it is in the zero state, and this is means it's in the one state. And the plus signal means it is in the uh, superposition state. And uh, the uh, Minus is also means that it's in a, another superposition state. So remember, this is uh, you know a determine a determining the state. This is zero, and this is uh, also another determining state. This is one, and uh, these two states is uh, you know under is is you know you don't know the state. It's a superposition state, and uh, it's I'm so sorry. So. Make confirm so the right one is one one and the left one is one minus one. Yeah. One negative one. Yeah. So um, okay, can keep going on. Yes. So uh, this is the review of last last uh, last uh, uh, presentation. Okay, so we also took some quantum gates 
uh, I don't know if you still remember this case. Mostly you can just uh, think this a linear algebra, uh, you know, transformation. For example, here, uh, maybe the first gate. The first gate you can just uh, uh, just uh, compute it with like x on the zero state. This is a qubit. This qubit is in a deterministic determined state. Then this is zero, and then you, then you can just compute it. And then you will get the result. This is, you know, zero one. So this means that if you apply a x gate on the zero, it will go to one state. Okay. Mm. And uh, basically, there's different operations to calculate the uh, the state of the qubit, right? Yeah. Mm. They will, uh, you know, make a difference on the state on the uh, on the on one qubit on the state. Uh, most of these are two on two qubits. We focus on this, uh, this this six. They will make a difference on one qubit and uh, make a difference on only one qubit. And uh, this is their special called Hadamard gate. I think we mentioned before. Use this Hadamard uh Hadamard gate, it will go to a superposition, you know, superposition state, not a you know original determined state. And uh, the superposition state has some uh, you know uh, uh you know some properties. For example, here if you uh, put a have a Hadamard gate on a zero qubit and uh, you will get the plus state. And uh, you if you will if you uh, on, uh if you use a like, H gate on the plus state, you will get back to the zero state. This is uh, some you know you can just mm -hmm. compute by the matrix. So this is uh, some typical So here problem. maybe uh, I confirm that given a qubit there are supposed to be four states. No, there's many, many infinite no, states. No. Um, so here we have determinate states on zero, one, or one, zero, right? So anyway, there is a probability, there is a probability distribution between zero and one. So my question is for the the result of the Hadamard operation, and you call it super, super superposition, right? Yes. And here, how these superpositions can contribute to the computation? Or our computation have to consider these superpositions during the during the uh, the gate operator. And what is, what does really means about these superposition and these plus and minus? I, I, I don't know. Superposition means that you can be zero or one. Um. So so here, all, so in this case, all the cases are in the superpositions, right? No, no, no. Because for example, for the zero state, this must be zero. It's not. It's determined. Mm -hmm. I got it. So, but the chances of the oh, oh, okay, I got it. So sometimes is it, is it the position is mm -hmm. uh you know one mm -hmm. for the zero state. But so, but, in, but in many cases, we are using superposition instead of the determinist positions, right? No, actually, we always from uh, start from the determine the state, and it goes to superposition state. So the superposition state is undetermined. No, yeah, it's non-determined superpositions. Yeah, it's uh, wow. it's not determined. It's it's a combined state. We can we can give you go further, you then you will have a much a uh, more understand on this. Here is the Z state. So you can check the Z state matrix is here. And uh, this is uh, the, uh, some properties of Z state. If we, uh, if we put a Z state on, uh, you know, on the plus qubit, this is a qubit. So this, sorry, uh, this is a qubit. So if you put a Z state on the plus state, plus qubit, and uh, you will just uh, uh, calculate the matrix. Uh, for example, you 
we, we remember that the matrix is, uh, sorry, the matrix is uh, one, zero, zero, minus one, and uh, then the is one, one. And uh, there's a coefficient is here, the coefficient, and then you will calculate it. So it is actually the qubit minus. So you will change it to from the plus state to the minus state. So this is dead gate. And however, we have a question here. If we, uh, if we, if we know the z state transform the plus to the minus. So how can we find a gate that does half of this transformation by finding the square root of the, the, of the matrix z? So the square root of a matrix z is actually goes to the imaginary, imaginary you know, space. It's a complex space, not our real number space. And uh, this uh, square root of z, we can define it as a new, as a new gate, it's s. And uh, it will transfer the plus state to the mu state. Here we are goes to the sphere. So use this s gate, we will transform the circle to a sphere and uh, it will finally goes to a, a totally uh, the quantum state. This is a totally the constant. There's a six state. These are six typical states we will use. The first is zero and the one. It is typical determined, determined state. And there's all the other state is superposition state. You know, it is not determined. And uh, this, these states also can be represented as a, you know, a matrix. So mostly you can from two angles to see the qubits. It's one from the matrix angle, the another is from the uh, the sphere member, the flush sphere member. So every uh, state will on the you know surface of this sphere. Okay, so let's keep going on. So here is a quick question. What is the probability of mentioning zero when you prepare the state of mu. Remember, if we mention the this, if we mention the plus state, remember this is a uh, here. So there will there will be fifty percent to go to the zero state. So I think it is quite similar. The mu state will also have fifty percent to go to the zero state. You can just uh, see this formula. Okay. Okay, let's proceed. Yeah. This uh, excuse me. Does uh, I mean, mm, so wait for a moment. Uh, yeah. Uh, does the uh, the plus and the minus is a determined? Is determined? no, no, not 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 determined. That's the proposition. Only the zero and the one is determined. Why? But but, but uh, uh, you you can you can reshoot the uh, notation. Uh, I just uh, <laughs> it's okay because you 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 write the hey, I don't know why, why I cannot and oh yeah yeah why yeah this is minus uh this is plus why it is not determined I cannot understand uh, here this one means that for the zero state and this one means for the one state so typically it should be right here. Okay, so there's 50% to go to the zero state and 50% goes to the one state. But uh, when you mentioned, you will find the final state. But before you mentioned- oh, By the way, so here, know, why do you say it's a 50%? So we have the uh, one over because square- Because the coefficient square. is here. But, all right, so I get it. So anyway, so I, I got it. So and then, so this is on um, cosine, um, the cosine with a theta of cosine uh, 45 degree, right? Yeah, you just uh, square that it, it will mm. zero point five. And uh, 
remember, so when you mention the qubit, there were only two states, zero and one. So zero and one is the determined state. When you mention it, it will only zero, there are only two states, okay? But before you mentioned that there, there were infinite states. And you, were, you actually don't know the states. There are only some, you know, coefficient to determine how possible we mention when we mention it will goes to the zero, will collapse to the one or collapse to the zero. Okay. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, any question? Um, can you reshare the screen? Okay. 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 Any question for this? I have no further question. You can further proceed. <clears throat> so, so maybe you can summarize a little bit. So we have determinate state and the super and the non determinate state. And determinate state using, using the de determinate positions and the super state will be relevant to super state uh, super positions. And we have different operators or the gate to, to, to make a qubit in either state, right? So yeah. sometimes we want it to be deterministic and sometimes we want it to be the non-deterministic. In terms of non-deterministic non -determinist states, we were using some gate to, um, for now we have the theta of the 45 degree. So that means uh, it were 50% of the probability. But later we may using the operator to change their positions and change their, uh, change the coefficients before the end ones so that we can do more uh, complicated complicated computation. Okay, mm. so let's go again. So you feel that, so these are six, some, you know, gates, they will, they will also only make difference to one qubit, to one qubit. And uh, after making the, maybe for example, this X, if we on the zero, determining state zero, it will goes to one. So, and uh, for example, H, it will go to a super position state plus. So these are the gates that can transform our gate, our determining state to a super position state. And uh, you can also use more gates like here. For example, here, this gate, this gate will go to more complex because it's not a unique number, it's a, a complex number. You will have, after you apply all these gates, you will have all the states in the sphere. So there, this is a, there are infinite states. Okay, so these are the review. Uh, of, you can please reshare the screen. Yeah, yeah, and just always, always, always put on the, okay. So here then we will go to a joint system. The joint system that has more than one qubits. For example, there are two qubits are brought together and we'd like to consider the new joint system that they form. And uh, we typically we use the tensor product, this signal to represent a joint state. And uh, some mathematics about the tensor product here. For example, if we uh, use you know, put a edge gate on one qubit, you know, edge gate is only make difference on one qubit. If we put edge gate on zero, this first qubit, and then we join with another qubit, we can calculate as this formula. This follows the distributed law. And uh, if there's, uh, if there's two, you know, zero, zero state qubit, and it can also be computed as this. Mm. Uh, by the way, so how the how we define the operator of this multiplication? Uh, this this is uh, I defined it before. Let me search the yeah, last uh, last 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 uh, presentation. We mentioned that this means. Oh, oh, oh. Yes. 
sorry. So these are all, you know, based on the mathematics. So these are commutations. They will go to a new state here. Okay. So remember, this is just a coefficient. This means how possible it goes to zero zero state. This means how possible it goes to zero one state. And this is one zero state, and this is one one state. Mm. Okay. And the master, you know, square is not just the same. You you the possibility should be square. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Then we go to uh, more details about the uh, a new state called the Bell state. Uh, this is a well-known joint state called the Bell state. It is combined by a zero zero and one one state. And uh, however, we can't write the Bell state as a product of two single qubit states because you can see here, this is a combined result we just mentioned of two single qubit states. If we calculate the coefficient here, you know, just uh, make this to the, this, this to the, this to zero, and then this to zero, and this to this. So somehow the Bell state just to reduce uh, four, 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 four possibilities into two possibilities, right? Yeah, and uh, for, uh, you know, for convenience, we will write this signal, signal to this. So we just uh, remove it. So it's just the same. This is actually the same. So we just uh, correspond the coefficient and uh, this will not stop. So there will be no coefficient. That means you can't write uh, a bell state as a product of two single qubit state. Mm. That's why. And how why about three? Hello? So how about three or four? What does that mean three or four? I mean, see here, the bell state is just work on two qubits, right? And what if, what if the, is that possible to, 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 to apply this, the bell state for four qubits or three qubits? No, this is Bell state is a defined state is for two qubits, not only, for... only okay, only for two qubits. Yes. Yeah, but in the long run, we're supposed to have many, many qubits on two to Yeah, finish. this is uh you know, this is not <laughs> this can be this is not a uh, this is a simple state that's defined by two states. Okay, that more state mm. can define on maybe maybe three qubits and four qubits. And maybe n qubits. Mm, okay. Okay. So this you, you first need to understand that this is different because the real state can't be a product of two single qubits. I just mentioned that you can't find a coefficient mm -hmm. a1, a2, b1, b2 to fulfill with the bell state. Why? Because it's different. The bell state is actually an entangled state. The two qubits are entangled, can never be separate, separated into two independent, independent states. Mm. But what we defined before, it is actually a product state. So that means it is, comes from two independent qubits. And this is two independent superposition states. These are product states, so they are quite different. So for more explanation, uh, for example, here the number of the number of the independent coefficient in such a product state is two n because every you know every every qubit there are only two coefficients, so the all coefficient is two n. However, if we calculate the 
rectangular uh, rectangular stage. That means uh, there are an n cube n qubits, and uh, you know n qubits can be two exponential with uh, power n stage. So it's quite different. Mm -hmm. Any question for this? Um, yeah, I have no problems. I have no questions for here. I think this is uh, the power of the quantum computing, which allow us to um, handle a huge number of uh, or explosive number of the states in the meantime. Yes. So he's, here is a, a so here is a, a picture you can see that because you can see the product state will be much smaller than the entangled state. Mm, okay. This is two power n, and uh, no matter how hard we try, it is only possible to create a product state using independent operation on single qubits. So to create entangled state, we need a new type of quantum gate. And uh, actually, we, we mentioned this before. So first, how to go to the bell state? We first getting into the superposition use the Hardman gate. So we first do a Hardman gate on the first qubit, and it will finally, after computation, will finally get this formula. And uh, you can compare with the bell state. You can say find that the only difference is here. So now we want to adjust the single case so that we can go to the bell state. Hmm. And then this is the phi naught gate. So this state is a uh, entangling gate. It will help the two qubits go to entangling. Hmm. And uh, this is the computer matrix for the this gate. So this gate is quite important because this after using this gate, the two two qubits can get entangled. Hmm. Okay, any question for this? Okay, maybe I have a brief comment here. So uh, so we know there's a phenomenon of the quantum entangling. So they're, they're, they're in terms of the physical world, they're saying that they are, they are, th that might be the only chance to make the information transmitted on surpass the speed of light. Right. So suppose there's two qubits which have entangled phenomena in two worlds. So we the maybe the one in us can 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 control uh can control the information, can pass information to the one on Jupiter's or uh, or Mars, whatever. So so even the, the transmission speed is even faster than light. And here they still have the same phenomena. The same phenomena can help us to build the uh, the so-called the C C not C C C not right the yes. control node. So basically, uh, we want to say if the two qubits are quite independent, and sometimes we we want these two qubits where it have um, shared information or shared phenomena share share we only have in the shared states. In this case, uh, this is way this might be the way to using the entangling gate to make two uh to Qubit on sharing the same behavior. Yes, so frankly speaking, it, uh, the signal gate is that when you find this is zero, so there's no change on the second uh, Qubit. So if the first bit is one, it will flip the second state. Mm -hmm. So okay. this is just the signal gate. Okay. Yeah, I don't know how the, how the physics is going to build this. But anyway, as long as we have the probability, so as long as we have this property, we can use these to build our own quantum machine. And hopefully the, the technology, the underlying technologies can be get advanced every year. Yeah. Okay. So now we go to a new, uh, new terminology. It means reversible. So if one function is reversible, it means you come from the output to get the different input. So if you have a same out, same output, if they have the same input, that means it is irre irreversible. So this is a new 
topic is about reversible. Mm. So here we want to solve a question and it goes to an algorithm. But before that, we will need some basic knowledge. Here we have a reversible black box and uh, there are uh, two input qubits. This is one qubit and this is another qubit. And the output will be uh, the same x and the uh, one tensor product with fx. fx is uh, just a function, a function, uh, you know, transferred by, uh, transformed by this gate, this unknown black box gate. So currently our work is to figure out what is the f function. So what is f? But for example, for example, here we have two measurements. You can see the first measurement is that uh, we input a zero. That means the x, y all be zero. And the output is that the x is zero. It's just the same. And the, this, this means this is a one. So this means that because y is zero, zero pro tensor product with f zero equals to one. And if you do math uh, mathematically, you can just uh, find that f zero equals to one. Okay. So for another the right part, you put an x gate on the zero state and you will get the one state. So this function, this measurement tells us that the first, the x is one and the y is still zero. So zero, product, uh, tensor product with F1 equals to zero. So this well, two measurement will tell us what is F. F is means that F0 is one and uh, F1 is zero. Okay. Okay, let's so proceed, this is, yeah. Yeah, this is how to get the black box. And then, and that's multiple, you know, probability uh, about FX. That's because there's only you know one qubit for the f, so there's only four possibility. The first possibility is that if uh, is that f zero equals to one and f one equals to zero, we just mentioned, and there's also three another possibility of the fx. So now our work is to get the fx, you know, to choose only one possibility to choose one. So this is the question and uh, here we have a new a new a new you know a new how to say a new gate you can also say a new gate typically we can define the uf this this black box as a uf and uh, after put the uf on the input you will get this output and uh, because the zero tensor product with fx is just equal to itself as uh, fx. So we typically will let the y equals to zero state. So this is uh, means x or x or uh, gate. And uh, if we input x as zero plus one, it's actually you know the this state if you have a coefficient, then the result will be just the compute, uh, mm. compute by the yeah, Maybe if we can just briefly introduce uh, the input and output of each gate. And as for the more details, I think we can uh, render the other talk and lecture for, for these. And I think there's a lot of interesting phenomena for us to go with. But I think for um, this talk, we just briefly go through uh, the, 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 the property of each gate and uh, just quickly go through them. Okay. So this is a very in important state. You can see that this state also combines F state, F zero state and F one state. Uh, uh, maybe we can go use uh, to see why it is important. It contains information about both F zero and F one. So it is as if we have evaluated F X for two values of X simultaneously. So a feature, a feature that is known as quantum parallelism. And uh, however, 
the that does not mean we can just uh, find a book just uses because the portability is the same. You can go through that that uh, though a uniform superposition over n bits can does contain information on to an evolution of x. This information is not immediately useful because you know these are the same because when you mention it, the superposition will clock to a single basis stage and yield the single outcome. That means when you mention this state, this output, it, you will only get one state of it, okay? And the, the each, you will get one state and the possibility is equal, is all, is still the 50%. That means even you, even, you just verify, you will, you will test all the states, but you will only get one answer. Mm. Okay, let's proceed. Okay. So this is a conclusion that in a simple one bit case, the superposition output of is the two bit state. The output is here. Mention the tag register in the computational basis yet either F0 or F1. Never the both because you know the after you mention the superposition, it will collapse to as a, either F zero or F one. So measurement collapse a uh, superposition down to one of these basis states with a probability corresponding to its coefficient. So in this case, any, any measurement outcome would be completely random. So it's not useful. Okay. So how to get this useful? This is a very, this is a very simple but famous problem called the D problem. This is the problem is that uh, we want to we want to know the fx is constant or is it zero on the one exactly half the time. So we want to know the fx. So here is a new this here is a problem. And we want to solve the problem use the qubit algorithm. And you will see that the classical algorithm will take much longer time than the qubit algorithm. So first we introduce the problem. The problem is that we want to know the fx is balanced or constant. Constant means that when you whatever you input, it will always get the same output. The same output, it will be all the one or all the zero. So this is a new problem. And we want to see, we want to check which fx is belong to balanced or constant. So for that classical, for classical uh, algorithm, we will mention two times because first, first we will mention the zero, zero state, you know, we will mention zero, zero, zero state. And then it will maybe it will output zero, zero. And then we will mention the one zero state. Then it will output one, one. That means it's not constant. Get it? So for classical, classical algorithm, we will need two times for this problem. We needed to mention two times to determine whether fx is constant or balanced. Any question for this? Yeah, I think there are supposed to be no questions. Let's keep proceed. Okay. Mm. So how to speed up? First, we try to import a different state. Remember, we just uh, input is, uh, is x0. Now we go to a new state, x plus. And then we can write as, as this because you know plus is just uh, uh, equals to so and uh, it follows the distributed law so you can write this and uh, after the u gate you can find this this is zero product tensor product with fx and uh, it equals to fx and this is one tensor product with fx and uh, this equals to uh, the inverse, the fx, that means f minus x. So when it is zero, the output will be this, 
And when fx equals to one, this will reverse the one to the zero. Reverse the one to the zero. So it will be x zero. And this state is just the same as this state. So we can't use this to speed up because the whatever the fx is, they are only the same output. So when you measure it, it will be the same. So when you measure it, you will only get this. So this is, you can't speed up by this formula. Okay, so if we change it to minus state, then remember the minus state is uh, minus, one minus. So after calculate, you will get this formula. When fx equals to zero, the output will be here. You just uh, put it in and then this is zero and then this is zero. So it will be one tensor bracket, tensor bracket zero, just uh, flip this, this qubit. So it still will be x one. So this equals to x minus. And uh, if you have x equals to one, this will equals to minus x minus. So this is different. That means this state can be mentioned as different. The final formula can be right as this. When fx is zero, it is this. If fx is one, it will be this. So this is how to speed up. If we input, input not x, remember we have tried x zero and it can't work. And we also try x one, it doesn't work. And x plus, it also can't work. But now x minus, it can work. So after use this, it's called phase query. So the phase query, just we mentioned this formula. And uh, maybe we have a, a quick question, maybe I just write down. Uh, after we input this x minus input, and uh, it will get a new output like this formula. So for example, if we input this x plus and minus, and then you just put it in, and uh, you will get uh, a, get the answer is like uh, maybe I can uh, I just show in the later late uh, in the second page. Yeah, I understand. So uh, if I think here, it it, it there's there I I do see there's a lot of interest in property to speed up the calculations and uh, to, to tangle the operations. But I think we can just go through uh, a very simple view of the um, gate. And once we have questions or have some detailed analysis, because when we look into the quantum computings, we want to see whether there are any research opportunity. So up until now, maybe I'm not quite, maybe I didn't grasp every details, but I still need to think about and what is the direction and how the devoted time and effort can be turned into some uh, production and improve our research productivity. So maybe can we can quickly go through them and, and I can have a quick quick comments and then I would, I would do think more, I would, I would put more thoughts into on how to combine the quantum computings with our existing AI security and, and, and software engineering research. So after putting this, so after we make our input as plus and uh, minus, this will only one computation and it will figure out whether FX is balanced and constant. If, for example, here, y, this is y. If fx, if, if fx is balanced, you will get this answer. If it is a constant, you will get this answer. So you can just mention these two states to determine whether the fx 
is balanced or not. So now we can change the classical algorithm two times to one times. So if you, uh, you know, extend this problem to n bits, it will classical will have two uh, a power n times to mention whether the fx is, uh, you know. Is, is, balance contest, balance yeah, yeah, constant, right? yeah, yeah, if, yeah. Let's if, keep going on. Yeah, yeah. If the quantum algorithm, which will only cost cost O n times, so here is the here is how they find it. After you mentioned by this formula, because you can see this will transform zero to plus. And this will transfer zero to minus. So it will fulfill the input. And after this black black box fx, and then you will mention it, whether it is minus or plus or minus. So you just add another edge gate and transfer the edge gate. If you if it is a plus, it will go to zero. It, if it is negative, it will go to one. So in this measurement, you find this is zero. That means you will output plus. So based on the this based on this population, you will find that if it's a constant, it will get the plus. So that means this is a constant state. So only if one measurement, you will get the answer. So this that's why the you know the quantum program is efficient. Mm, okay. Okay, that's all for my presentation. Mm. There are some bigger problems, but uh, maybe we didn't have enough time to go through it. So we yeah, are- I just can share some details, but I think both Xianghui and uh, Yufan, I think you did a very good job for the preparation, for the preparations. Um, we, you can share the slides in the group and uh, I will upload the videos later. Um, I think for Xianghui, there's a very interesting. This is, I, I do, we do see that how to encoding existing software engineering problems into a mathematical and probability problems and solve it with efficiency. And for quantum computing, so I, I just feel that once we look into the gate operators, uh, they do have a lot of opportunities. But what I can see is that it's more from a programming language point of view, not software engineering, not AI. but but I still need to think more about it. And if, uh, if I can think more about it and how approach maybe later can and can can, can connect the dots um, between our research and the quantum computings. I think the quantum computings when successful, that might reshape the all the computational world, especially in the time of the metaverse, right? So there are so many uh, computationally expensive application there and maybe the quantum computation maybe the quantum computation may play a role uh, in the near future. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so thanks everyone for attending. So I understand so this may be a little bit exhaustive. Um, but never mind. Uh, let's uh, let's call it a day and uh, we will have more discussions later. Okay, thanks everyone and thanks again to Xianghui and Yufan. Mm. Bye.